Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, so I've been asked to talk a little bit uh, on, on an update of vitiligo. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what causes vitiligo, and, uh, and that'll help us to understand where some of the new treatments are coming from. And, and certainly, uh, the new hope piece is, is the most exciting part, I think. Um, David had mentioned that, that, that for patients um, and, and their doctors, uh, this is a really very exciting time, I think, to be uh, focused on vitiligo, to be taking care of vitiligo, to be helping people with vitiligo. Um, we've been treating vitiligo for, for over 3,400 years uh, since the Iron Age. We have ancient medical texts in India showing how to treat vitiligo. And, uh, and things, uh, the treatments hadn't changed in thousands of years um, until maybe the past five or so. Um, so it is very much a very exciting time. Uh, let's see. So I, I always, as a physician, I always start with disclosures. These are companies that I've worked with um, uh, to help develop their drugs for vitiligo, give advice, um, test in clinical trials, test in the laboratory. And one that I'll highlight is, is Insight, uh, who has uh, the, the first FDA approved treatment for vitiligo. We're gonna talk about them. But they also recently acquired uh, a drug that I developed called oromolumab, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, that's a, a potential conflict in, in, uh, in my presentation today. So what causes vitiligo? I always like to start out with that. We know that it causes white spots in the skin, but how does that happen? And uh, this is this is how the skin functions. We have um, this upper layer of skin. This is the outer surface of our skin um, that gets hit by ultraviolet light uh, pretty frequently. And so we want to protect that skin with melanin that absorbs light. This is what gives our skin color its color. And uh, <clears throat> the cells that produce that melanin are called melanocytes. Uh, they they look like this, kind of scattered around. You can't see them over here. They're 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 hard to recognize there. But this is just a cartoon of a melanocyte sitting in the lower portion of this this uh, part of the skin, making pigment and then transferring that to other cells called keratinocytes. And what you can see are all these keratinocytes making up the outer layer of skin, and they're taking up this pigment and creating a little parasol or umbrella or cap. Um, the cap is forming over their nucleus where the DNA lives. And we don't want the DNA to be hit by too much UVB uh, or, or, or UVA. Um, either way, ultraviolet light can damage the DNA and, and cause mutations, and, and that can lead to skin cancer. So the pigment in our skin is protective from that. This is how it works. The melanocytes make the pigment and uh, transfer that to other cells. This isn't so related to vitiligo, but I think it's interesting. Um, people often ask, well, what determines skin color? Do I just make more pigment than than someone else if I have darker skin. And, and it's a little more complicated than that. And, and you don't have more um, melanocytes, more pigment making cells if you have darker skin. Um, you actually have uh, just make different types of pigment. So darker skin makes this, this uh, elongated, what we would call American football shaped um, pigment um, and, and, and it's darker. Whereas medium skin makes a little bit less elongated um, and less pigmented and light skin makes more what we would say baseball shaped, I guess you guys would say cricket ball shaped um, uh, melanin and, and it's a little bit lighter. So this is what gives uh, the skin its color. Now in vitiligo, if we have these melanocytes sitting here, um, they're making the pigment, they're transferring that to the keratinocytes. All the keratinocytes take it up, as we said. Um, what happens in vitiligo are your immune cells or T cells come in through the blood vessels and they find their way into the skin. They find the melanocytes and um, they think there's something wrong with them. They, they think they're either infected by a virus or um, they've become a cancer and they need to protect you from that. And even though they're completely normal, those T cells kill those cells. And in the absence of those cells, you essentially get a white spot over them because they're not able to make pigment um, for the for the epidermis anymore. And and so this is an example of of often what we see in vitiligo. This is a spot, a uh, white spot, where all the overlying uh, keratinocytes don't have pigment anymore. But the hair follicles are still their normal color, and this is illustrated here. So we have a nice hair follicle growing out of the skin, and and there's a little pocket of stem cells. Uh, uh, future melanocytes sitting there and living there. And, and so if we're able to treat the skin, those cells will crawl out of the hair follicle and back into the skin, and then they'll create pigment again. Um, and, and that's why we see little spots of pigment around the hair follicles when, when vitiligo gets better. So um, we've known that 
for a long time. Um, and, and, and so in the past 15 years or so, when I've been studying vitiligo, I had a number of questions that I wanted to start with. And, and we study vitiligo very carefully uh, with the goal of developing new treatments for disease. Although just understanding how it works is also very interesting to us. But as a lead in, this is a patient who came into my clinic one day, you can see a widespread vitiligo all over his body. Um, and for unrelated reasons, he had received a kidney transplant as well. So he was on medication to prevent rejection of his kidney and, and that suppresses the immune system. And we noticed that on that medication, his skin repigmented really beautifully better than anyone I'd ever seen. And so I like to joke that if we, if we were able to treat every vitiligo patient with um, immunosuppression uh, to the level of kidney transplant, um, their skin would do well. Uh, but the problem is uh, kidney transplant immunosuppression is dangerous, and, and that suppresses the rest of the immune system as well and, and can, can um, make you susceptible to other things like infection and cancer. But we decided that if the immune system was really at the core of vitiligo, maybe we could develop a more targeted immunotherapy, uh, a, a new targeted treatment that would shut off just part of the immune system that causes vitiligo while leaving the rest of the immune system intact. And we can do this in psoriasis and, um, and eczema and other diseases where we target just one protein uh, that's part of the immune system and, and it treats disease beautifully and is very safe. And the problem is these drugs for, for psoriasis and eczema don't work for vitiligo. And, and so we had to find the equivalent pathway in vitiligo. So our strategy in the lab is really to, to take different aspects of research, different types of research and tie them all together. Um, they're all focused on vitiligo. And uh, we start with a mouse model of vitiligo. So this is a mouse that has black skin and we can see little black, uh, white spots here on the tail, the feet and the ears and the nose. And so the mouse gets vitiligo and this allows us to really understand in detail um, what causes the disease. We also use translational research where we take uh, skin and blood from my patients uh, with the vitiligo. They're very, we couldn't do anything that we do without my patients um, and, and their, their generous contributions to, to help us understand what's happening in their skin. So we, we study this in humans. And then clinical trials and clinical studies are really studying um, uh, new drugs in, in, um, in, in large trials or uh, describing kind of how vitiligo affects the life of patients. Um, and so we tie all these things together. This allows us incredible high resolution, detailed insight into what causes the disease, um, but allows us to tie it back to human disease so that we can really understand um, how everything works so we can develop treatments that are relevant to humans. So one of the first things that we did is to look at the skin of both mice and humans um, and look at what genes are turned on in the skin. Um, this is kind of a simple way to start looking at what might be driving vitiligo. Um, and, and one of the first things that we saw were a loss of, of markers of melanocytes. These are, these are genes that only melanocytes turn on. And you can see that they're going down in vitiligo. Um, and that makes sense because the melanocytes are being destroyed or removed from the skin. Um, the black bars here are, are human genes. The white bars are mouse genes. And you can see that the, the human and the mouse genes are, are very similar to each other, telling us that the mouse model is really useful to understand what's happening in humans. Um, and, and what we saw was uh, a series of genes, a family of genes that you can see here turning on in both mouse and human that belong to a very specific pathway. And this pathway is, is led by a, a protein called the interferon gamma. This is a protein that helps us to fight viruses. But we can see that this is turned on. And then all these genes here are downstream of interferon gamma. Interferon gamma turns them on. And, and there's a bunch of genes that we see that are not turned on. And this is important because we have very good drugs to target these genes. Um, to treat other diseases. So these are, these are drugs that target um, what we call the IL-17 pathway to, to treat psoriasis. Uh, these are uh, drugs that target the type 2 pathway to, uh, to treat atopic dermatitis or eczema. And you can see this is why these drugs don't work for vitiligo, uh, because they're targeting pathways that, that are not turned on. So we had to try to find a way to target uh, this pathway, the interferon gamma pathway. Um, and so our hypothesis started with interferon gamma driving vitiligo. And, and so these are two fellows in my lab who've helped tremendously. This is Mehdi Rashigi and Jillian Richmond, who studied in my lab and really spent a lot of time uh, on this pathway in particular. First of all, we see interferon gamma is a protein that signals through its receptor called interferon gamma receptor. 
And that turns on uh, JAK1,2 in keratinocytes, those, those surface cells of the skin that then activate another protein uh, that then turn on other genes downstream that help to recruit more T cells into the skin. So interferon gamma stimulates uh, this, this homing, these homing markers, this beacon to attract more T cells into the skin through their receptor. And that creates a, 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 this, this constant loop where cells are climbing into the skin and finding melanocytes and killing them. And, and so we spent uh, many years actually in our mouse model, uh, you know, removing these proteins, these genes from the mice and asking whether they could still get vitiligo. And the question was, uh, the answer was no. So if we remove um, essential parts of the signaling pathway that starts with interferon gamma, the mice were protected from vitiligo, telling us that the interferon gamma was really responsible for driving this process. We could also use drugs that target these pathways, uh, this this pathway, and we could use antibodies um, that are that can become drugs that target pieces of this. And and not only did that prevent vitiligo, but it also reversed it, telling us that interferon gamma didn't just cause vitiligo, but it was uh, required for maintaining it. And and then we we were able to show that JAK inhibitors, which are these small molecules here that that inhibit the JAKs that are downstream of interferon gamma signaling, were also prevented and reversed vitiligo. And so Mady and I worked with a, a group in New York led by Angela Cristiano, where we had a patient with vitiligo and we actually treated him with an oral JAK inhibitor called ruxolitinib. Uh, this is a drug that's used to treat a, a type of leukemia, blood cancer. And, um, and, and when we gave it to this patient, he repigmented his face. You can see this is before, this is the pigment after in about five months, which was very, very rapid. He got a great response to that. And we, we were also following his blood uh, concentration of CXCL10, which is one of those downstream markers, downstream of interferon gamma. And we could see that that marker was elevated in his blood, really showing that he, he had ongoing vitiligo and inflammation. And this was present for over a year, uh, this high level of CXCL10 in his blood. But as soon as he started taking ruxolitinib, that level dropped. Um, really telling us not only do JAK inhibitors work in vitiligo, but they seem to be working the way we'd hypothesize by blocking interferon gamma and reducing uh, its effects. So um, Brett King uh, at Yale also published a case uh, of vitiligo, a patient with vitiligo treated with Zeljans or tofacitinib, another JAK inhibitor. And then David Rosemarin in, uh, at Tufts in Boston took this very same drug and put it into a cream and tested it topically in a number of patients. And, and both of those uh, worked. So based on, on all of this data, uh, a number of pharmaceutical companies decided to run clinical trials to test JAK inhibitors for vitiligo. And this is Zena Yabas, who was a fellow in the lab that helped me run these trials. First, I'll tell you about Insight. Um, they make uh, ruxolitinib and they put it into a cream following Dave, David Rose Marin's lead in 12 patients. And, and this trial was conducted in over 157 people in the US. And they were testing different doses of the drug as well as a vehicle or placebo control. Um, and this was for six months. And then after six months, the vehicle control uh, patients got a higher dose of drug. And then after a year, everybody got the highest dose of drug. And we followed them for, for now three years. And, and as you can see, so here, uh, the way we present clinical trial results is uh, to, to state how many patients, what percent of patients achieved the primary outcome we were looking for. And in this case, the primary outcome is the green bar called the FVASI 75. This is the facial vitiligo area scoring index 75. So essentially it just represents 75% improvement on the face. And, and it would be essentially going from this to this. Um, we can see that the vehicle control, patients who got the vehicle actually had 0% of them achieved this. So, so very low placebo rate, which is great. Um, nice, clean data. And then in the green bar, we saw 30% of patients in the trial uh, achieved this goal after six months. And over 50% achieved this after a year. And this continued to, to improve to, over, to almost three quarters of the patients after two years achieving this on the face. Um, if we raise the bar a little bit and required a VASI 90, so 90% 90 improvement, the results were a little bit lower, but they actually came up to about two thirds of patients after two years. So this tells us that the drug is, is effective um, compared to placebo. And it also tells us that we need to be very patient. Uh, it takes a long time for pigment to come back. And this is those melanocytes crawling out of the hair follicles that we said that takes time. Um, if we look at the TVASI or the total body VASI instead of the, the face, it's slower. 
Um, this is the TVAS E75 uh, is the green bars. You can see that's pretty slow to respond. 50% um, improvement was better. And this is just because there, there's a lower density of hair follicles on the body, uh, much higher density on the face. That's why it responds faster. But you can see that in the phase two clinical trial in 157 patients, uh, patients actually responded um, very well. So this allowed us, uh, provided the rationale to do a phase three clinical trial. Uh, this was just published um, a couple weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this trial was conducted in uh, over 670 patients all over the world. And, and in this time, we were able to enroll patients uh, down to the age of 12. So we were able to test it in adolescence. And, and we only tested the highest dose of drug based on the results from the previous trial and compared that to placebo as well. This was for six uh, months, and then, um, and then everybody got the highest dose of drug. And fascinatingly, we saw the exact same results. So about 30% achieving the FASI 75 after six months. In, in these two trials, the, the 670 patients were divided into two large groups and tested that way. And both trials showed the exact same result um, as the phase two clinical trial. So that this tells us that the, the, the results are really robust and, and believable. Our placebo rate was a little bit higher. We think that's, that's because a, a lot more sites were involved in, uh, and there wasn't quite as much expertise in vitiligo that we had in the first phase, but still uh, very strong uh, results of the cream. It appeared to be very safe. Uh, the, only, the only side effects that we saw from using that cream in these trials uh, that were are more common in the drug compared to placebo were acne at the site of application of the drug and pruritus or itching at the site of application. So about 5% got acne or, or itchiness at the site of application. So it was very well tolerated. People uh, didn't mind the side effect because they were getting good results, their vitiligo. So based on all this, the, uh, the, the Federal Drug Administration approved topical ruxolitinib as the first FDA-approved treatment to, to reverse vitiligo. Um, this happened in July um, of this year. And of course, soon after that, I, I got about 300 phone calls from my patients asking for the treatment. So we've, we've just gotten a number of patients on it um, for a few months, and, and we're seeing great results. So the next trial I want to tell you about was, was conducted by Pfizer. Um, and this is an oral drug uh, called ritlacitinib. This was just accepted for publication in the JAD, um, the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology. Ritlacitinib blocks JAK3, one of the JAKs that we were talking about, as well as another enzyme called TEC kinase. And this was tested in a phase 2B clinical trial. And uh, the patients were randomized to a bunch of different doses of drug, including placebo. Uh, and then after six months, everybody was put on the highest dose of drug. And... Um, this trial was a little bit different from the last one because it required patients to have active vitiligo. Their, their vitiligo had to be actively spreading in order to enroll in this trial. And you can imagine that that is a little bit more difficult to treat when patients' vitiligo is, is really rip-roaring. We kind of say it's on fire. It's like a forest fire that's, that's difficult to control. Um, I had suggested to the company that they not make this requirement uh, because this is a little bit harder uh, to treat. Um, and, and what they saw was, was a smaller response than they saw uh, in the, than we saw in the last trial. We could see a dose response, meaning the higher the dose, the better the response after six months. But after six months, only 12% achieved this primary outcome of FVASI 75 compared to the 30% in the, in the CREAM trial. Um, we think that this was because uh, only active patients were, were enrolled into this trial, and so it was harder to treat them. Um, and when everybody was put on the highest dose, you can see everybody then improved uh, even more. But because we had enrolled active patients and, and some of their spots were active and some of their spots were stable, we we're able to separate out those spots to see, well, what do active spots do with when treated with this drug? And what does stable spots do when treated with the drug? And, and what we saw was the active spots um, treated with drug got um, no, sorry, the, the active spots treated with placebo got worse. This is, if it goes up, it gets worse. And, and the active spots treated with the drug actually stabilized. They didn't change over time, showing that the drug was able to stop active disease. And if you looked at the stable spots, the stable spots treated with drug, uh, the stable spots treated with placebo vehicle didn't change. They remained stable but the stable spots treated with drug actually got better. So this told us that this oral drug actually was able to stop active disease and improve the stable disease. Um, so th this is, is very promising. Uh, 
Um, in terms of adverse events, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to know um, what side effects were from the drug because the placebo rate of reported side effects was very high. It's about 80% here, which isn't that much different from, from those on the drug. We do suspect that uh, oral JAK inhibitors like this can cause some side effects. We've seen that with some other drugs that are already on the market. And so we need to be careful with these and, and think through that as we prescribe them for our patients in the future. But this was a promising trial that will be repeated in a phase three um, and, and maybe give us an oral option for patients. So I want to tell you about this. This is a, an observation we make in the clinic all the time. Um, when patients have vitiligo and we treat them and make them better, um, when we stop the treatment, about 40% of them see the disease come back within a year of stopping the drug. And this is a paper by Thierry Passeron, who is uh, in France, and reported this very specifically. It's a great paper showing us that about 40% of patients see their disease come back within a year of stopping. And this can be reduced if we just treat them with um, other topical therapies um, infrequently. We can reduce that rate a lot. But to me, the other important thing was not just that vitiligo comes back. This is one of my patients who we repigmented with narrowband UVB treatments. Um, but then she got pregnant and had to stop her treatments. And the disease came back um, in the exact same place. This is where it was before. So the vitiligo not only comes back, but it comes back in the exact same place that it was before, telling us that the skin has immune memory at that location, uh, that the skin somehow remembers it's supposed to have vitiligo. And, um, and we wanted to know why that was. So we went back to my lab and, and started to study that. And it turns out we weren't the only ones asking this question at that time. So there were three other groups around the world who are also studying this question. Um, and, and we all found the exact same result. Um, and, and it's it's that uh, T cells form what's called resident memory T cells. They essentially glue themselves into the skin and stay there forever, um, allowing uh, the disease to return after treatment is stopped. So here's just a cartoon of that of what's happening here, of what I told you before and, and, and how these cells form. First of all, a T cell, uh, we call it a CD8 T cell. These are responsible for killing your own cells in case they're cancer or infected with a virus. Um, one of these T cells enters the skin and finds a pigment cell, finds a melanocyte, and makes this interferon gamma that we were talking about. That interferon gamma stimulates the surrounding cells to make CXCL10, some of these genes that we talked about downstream of interferon gamma. And as I said before, this causes the recruitment of more T cells. So it's kind of like ants crawling around on the ground and finding some, uh, some melted ice cream and laying a trail and, and telling all its buddies to come and, and, and help it uh, eat the ice cream. So these T cells find it, lay a trail, and then recruit more and more T cells. And this, um, they kill the melanocytes and cause the vitiligo spread. So it turns out that a proportion of these cells convert into a, a type of cell called resident memory. And this simply means that they, they uh, upregulate proteins on their surface that glue them in um, and they cause them to stay right here and they never leave. So when a melanocyte tries to regrow and, and bring pigment back to the skin, those cells see that melanocyte, engage with it very early, and then repeat the whole process. Uh, so more T cells come in and kill that melanocyte. Now we can turn these cells off with treatments, JAK inhibitors, conventional treatments, all these things turn these cells off to allow disease to get better. But when the treatments are stopped, the cells are still there uh, and they wake back up and they cause the disease all over again. And we can see that here. We saw this in our mouse model. This is Vincent, who was a student in the, in the lab at the time. We can treat our mice with tofacitinib, a JAK inhibitor, or ruxolitinib, and the mice get better. Um, but the problem is their, their resident memory T cells don't change. They're still sitting there. Um, and this is what we just described, that they, they get turned off by, by, by the treatments, but not removed. So we asked in the lab, well, could we develop a better treatment for vitiligo, one that works better and, and lasts longer, if we could target these cells and remove them from the skin, essentially erasing the autoimmune memory that causes vitiligo. And so Jillian, a postdoc in the lab at the time, discovered a way to do this. And essentially, we, we discovered that a protein called IL-15 is responsible for maintaining those cells in the skin. So the cells have to have IL-15 signaling in order to survive. And if we shut off IL-15 signaling, we can do this with an antibody. We can see that the pigment came back. This is return of pigment in the mouse tails. You can see from here to here. And then importantly, we saw that those resident memory T cells were removed. Those were erased. And so when we see those cells go away, then, then there's hope from much better and longer lasting treatment, even when it stopped. Um, and we found also when we treated the mice just for a couple of weeks uh, with this treatment, 
um, their their skin continued to, to get better for, for many weeks, for months afterward. Um, so really uh, an exciting opportunity. So this is a cartoon of how IL-15 keeps these cells alive. IL-15 is made by the keratinocytes, the other cells, and kind of held out in a claw. Um, and then the T cells coming in see that cytokine, um, that protein, with its own receptor called IL-15 receptor. And then that signals through JAKs as well. Um, and so the T cells, this relationship is what keeps the T cells alive. And we can block that either with an antibody against uh, IL-15, the cytokine. And Amgen is a, a large drug company that has an antibody that does this. And this is being tested in an ongoing clinical trial uh, for vitiligo, currently recruiting in the U.S. And I actually started this trial, but I had to uh, recuse myself. Um, because I received um, venture funding, um, Series A funding to start a company called Valeris Therapeutics, where we made an antibody against the receptor um, for IL-15. And there's a number of reasons why we actually think this antibody is going to work, um, and, and this one uh, may not work as well. And so we we thought that this was a better form, um, which is why we started the company. And uh, we made a drug called Oromolumab, and uh, we're excited. We're, we're hoping to be, we were hoping to be in clinical trials uh, early next year. Um, but uh, about two weeks ago, Insight uh, Corporation actually acquired my company and, and now uh, purchased Aromolimab, and they're going to take it forward in clinical trials as well. So there might be a little bit of a delay, but we expect uh, they're going to do a great job considering they ran the clinical trials for ruxolitinib um, and take this forward uh, into patients, hopefully again next year. So really excited about this opportunity to, to create a, a systemic treatment um, that you can take. It would be an injection in the skin and would treat all of your skin um, and hopefully have long lasting effects. All right, I'm just seeing that there was a question and I'll, I guess I'll probably take that at the end. Let me finish this for now and then we'll get back to the questions uh, at the end. So this is just the end of the talk. Uh, a couple of other ideas that we had to develop new treatments for vitiligo. We say that uh, this is at the right place at the right time. And part of the reason is finding a way to get the drug to the right location where it needs to be and not cause side effects in other places. But it also is, is part of the fact that I was in the right place at the right time to meet the right people to help me develop these treatments. So in 2006 at UMass uh, Medical School, which is where I, I, I work, um, Craig Mello, one of my colleagues here, won the Nobel Prize for discovering something called RNAi. Um, and the details of this is, is pretty complicated and, and we don't have time to get into it right now. But at the time, they thought that this could be a potential new treatment for any human disease. Um, using RNAi. But the problem was it was very short-lived uh, in the body. Once you inject things like this into the body, it, it doesn't last very long. And it's very hard to get it to the right location. So if you have a liver disease, how do you get this into the liver? If you have a skin disease, how do you get it into the skin or the brain? Um, and, and it turns out Anastasia Kvorova, who is another colleague of mine here, uh, is a chemist that developed a way to convert this into a long-lasting drug that goes to the right uh, tissue where it needs to be. And she won um, uh, Nature Biotech's uh, 25, top 25 at the top last 25 years for this modification, showing that she could create uh, an siRNA chemical that was delivered to the central nervous system or the brain. Um, and Atalanta uh, is a company that launched out of this with $110 million venture capital to treat neurodegenerative diseases like uh, Luke Eric's disease, ALS, uh, Huntington's disease. They're working on this now. Um, so Anastasia is here. She's a friend. And, and I said, hey, can we, you know, you can get it into the brain. Can we get this into the skin? And, and there's a lot of detail here, but I just want to show that we were able to inject this drug uh, that she created into the skin of mice. And we were able to turn off interferon gamma receptor. So remember, interferon gamma is driving the whole process. And this drug turns off the receptor. And this is uh, the, the code for the receptor, the RNA for the receptor. This is the protein for the receptor. And we're able to turn it off very well. And we're able to show that this drug reduces the production of CXCL9 and 10. Remember that these are drive vitiligo downstream of interferon gamma. So when we give interferon gamma, the drug turns them off. And so we're working now on, on putting this, we've, we've put this into our mouse model and shown um, some benefit. And so we're working on this as a new drug op opportunity uh, for vitiligo. Lastly, uh, Chow was a student in my lab who um, came and said, I want to develop a new 
antibody, uh, antibody to, as a treatment for vitiligo. And I remembered that my mentor at Penn when I was training, John Stanley, who was chair of the department at the time, um, had developed an idea to, 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 to create a smart drug, a smart biologic that would actually uh, be tethered or home to the skin and do its job very specifically only in the skin. Um, and the details are a little complicated, but uh, but this is kind of the, the, the punchline where Chow took the conventional antibody that blocks interferon gamma. I've shown you that this already helps vitiligo, but the problem is it causes immunosuppression in the blood. So it turns off immune responses to other things and causes infections and things. So we wanted to keep it in the skin where it would be safe, uh, where it would treat vitiligo and not cause problems elsewhere. So we took this antibody, uh, the old antibody, and we converted it into what we call a bispecific antibody. We actually took an antibody uh, and put it on its tail. So now this, this drug binds two things. This binds interferon gamma and turns it off, turns off vitiligo. And this binds to keratinocytes in the skin and tethers it or, or, or locks it there. And you can see that the old antibody, if we inject it into the foot pad of this mouse, and the new antibody, that the new antibody stays there um, for now two days and longer. But the old antibody leaks out. Um, and, and gets into the blood and goes into the rest of the body. And so you can see that this antibody goes everywhere and can cause immunosuppression in the, in the blood, um, whereas this antibody stays where it's supposed to and can only treat that area. And this is these are graphs just showing that. Um, here's a movie of the mouse. We have like a little CAT scanner for our mice, uh, and we can see that this, this drug goes everywhere, and, uh, and our new drug stays just where it's supposed to. Finally, when we treated vitiligo, we could show that when we injected just this foot pad with a drug, only this foot pad was protected. There's more pigment here than in the other one, um, as you can see here and here. And so then that shows that the foot, the foot pad that we injected the drug is protected. And uh, in the other drugs, there was no um, lo local effect here. This is anti-interferon gamma that worked everywhere. And this is the other drug that we used uh, to create the first drug, and it didn't do anything for vitiligo. So this is really uh, telling us that we could develop a drug that stays where it's supposed to, to treat vitiligo. All right, so, so that's it. This is the summary of all that. Um, we already walked you through this. We could develop treatments that target interferon gamma signaling, like JAK inhibitors that reverse vitiligo that's FDA approved now. We could potentially develop an IL-15 inhibitor, like an antibody that could have longer lasting effects, more durable effects, and uh, we're excited for that. We could use conventional antibodies. We could use the new biospecific antibodies. We could use this Nobel Prize winning siRNA. We're working on all these things to try to, to make vitiligo better. So this is uh, just kind of a, a cartoon showing how this all works. If you wanna shut off a lamp, let's say there's just one lamp that you wanna shut off, if this is vitiligo, um, you, you could do it by shutting off the main switch that turns off everything in the house. But we don't want to suppress the immune system in that way. So um, this would turn off vitiligo, but it would turn off your viral defense and parasite defense and bacteria. So as we get closer, we can find better treatments that turn off just the lamp and leave everything else intact. And that, that's our goal to, to treat vitiligo. So these are the people in the lab that do the work. These are my collaborators at UMass that help me. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy to take questions if there are time. I thank you, first of all, Dr. Harris, for um, that fantastic presentation. Um, I think there are, easy, we, had, we do have a few minutes um, if, if you're able to, to stay and we've got lots of questions for you. So sure. I guess, if you, can you see the Q&A function? I can, yeah, you yeah. want me to just read them and go? Would you just like to, to dive in if that's okay? Yeah, sure. So Yorsa uh, asked, I've recently seen a clinic offering Exaplex, which is eczema light therapy, who said this has given vitiligo patients good results to the panel. Have any views in this treatment? Um, so, you know, the others can mention this, um, and it looks like some have already have. There's some answers there. Um, but uh, yes, so eczema laser is a is a laser that, that um, uses narrowband UVB. Um, one, la one, one, one laser of that narrowband UVB. We've been using this uh, from the sun for many, many thousands of years. Um, but the eczema laser is a focused way to, to deliver that to the skin, and, and it is a very effective. The challenge is it only treats a very small uh, area of skin. So if you have vitiligo all over your body, it's, it's not very easily treated using that. Um, but if, if it's just in small areas, then it does work. Um, Panna uh, Gringi says, I have personal experience of an immunosuppressant cream. Um, Protopic, which reversed, 
what could have been early vitiligo patches still in the active phase. Having researched this further, I've found other success stories too. What do you think about this cream as a treatment for early vitiligo? Is there a distinction between treatments for early and more settled progression? So it appears that whether your vitiligo is stable or active, uh, the same treatments uh, work for both. It just takes longer to work if it's active disease and active spreading. You have to slow it down first and then move it along. Um, and protopic, uh, also the generic is called tacrolimus, is very effective cream. We've been using this for 20 years to treat vitiligo, um, and it is very effective. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think before we, we talked a lot about the new treatments today, but protopic's been around a long time, and I still use it in my patients. It, it works even better if you combine it with a little bit of light. So in the summer for us, protopic works the best, and in light exposed areas like the face. Do we know when the FDA approved drugs might be available in the UK? So I talked to Insight and, uh, and they're working on this. They're hoping um, by next year, it will be approved in the, in, in the UK um, and probably would have to be only 12 and older since it doesn't mean that the drug is unsafe in kids under 12. It just means that it's only been tested in, in the age 12 and older. So that's, that's all they're allowed to market it to. I have prescribed the drug for, for younger kids. Um, uh, but it's just not approved yet for the for, for that age. But hopefully in the future, we're, we're starting to test it in kids now in clinical trials. Uh, an anonymous attendee, I want to say huge thanks for persevering with the research uh, to provide hope. Um, great to hear that's all, all that's being done. Yeah, uh, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, it's my passion in life and, and I love working with vitiligo patients. And, and again, I, I have to say a huge thanks to my patients um, who are, 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 allowing us to study this disease in them, um, sacrificing for us, that they're, they're a big part of this as well. If orlimumolumab is shown to be effective in insights trials, how many years do I think it'll take to get FDA approval? Probably five years or so uh, from this point. Um, if we start clinical trials, it'll be in, in phase, what's called phase one, just, just safety trials uh, next year. And it takes probably three or four years uh, to, to, to run a phase two and then phase three and then get FDA approval. So, um, so, so I would say five years. Uh, the results sound promising. Did I notice any difference in effectiveness between those who've had vitiligo for a long time and those with more recent disease? So fascinatingly, no. Um, it doesn't matter if you've had vitiligo for a really long time. Uh, it, it, at least in the clinical trial for rexolitinib, it still works well. Um, but the key piece is that you have to have hair that are pig, that's pigmented growing in those spots. Um, if you don't have hair in the area, like on the fingertips or on the top of the feet, or if the hair has been turned white, then we really don't see good responses. But even if you've had vitiligo for 20 years, if you have hair there, um, it responds well. So that's the good news.